with the Phoenix, we have several new sets, and the sets are incredible. I mean, Stuart Craig is a brilliant designer. It's a team thing. There's an interface in lots of different directions with, with other departments, not least the director, of course. And action! Every director has a desire to separate themselves from what's gone before or find a new take on it. David expressed a preference in the very early days for, for simplicity. He's just a great director who sort of never settles for less and he'll always push for more and greater detail, things, which is brilliant. So what is this place? It's headquarters. The Grimmel play set is fantastic. I mean, if there was one set on Harry Potter that I'd like to live, it would be there. It's just incredible. It's a typical 18th century Georgian square in London, terraced houses. In that sense, it's typical. What is very untypical, of course, is the way it magically appears. It appears from behind a drain pipe in the front elevation of this square. It has only one dimension, then it develops out into two, two dimensions, then the third dimension as, as the front steps pop forward and the windows sink back. In you go, son. Then you open the front door. Everything inside is strangely distorted, compressed in width or, or length, uh, exaggerated in height. It's just a logical extension of, of where it's come from. The house is the ancestral home of Sirius Black, and he's hiding out here. What? No hello for me. And the whole feeling of it is of enclosure. That's why Stuart designed the sets with very high ceilings, and lots of the windows are mirrored to give another effect of enclosure you can't see out. Its period detail is as you would expect, but has this kind of exaggeration about it. It's incredibly decayed, incredibly dusty, the woodwork is all black, ebonized. It's full of character. As you come in, the walls of the hall are all a dark gray silk. We like using silk on the walls because it's easy to distress. It looks good if it's aged. The floor of the hall is a tessellated tile effect in black and white, but much aged down. My mother did that when I ran away. Charming woman. I was 16. We've got sort of a genetic backstory in this film. The whole black family tree is up in, in a lovely scene between Harry and Sirius. Mira, um, the head of graphics, designed the tapestry very much with J.K. Rowling. In the book, there are only a handful of names on the black family tree, but when you bring it to film, you actually have to visualize it. So I called Joe and said, Joe, we need some more information. Can you help us? 15 minutes later, she faxed down a copy of the Black Family Tree, which had went back four or five generations, had 75, 100 names on it, and such is the depth of her knowledge that she's able to pull that out like that. We had it painted on specially woven tapestry fabric, and just small areas of it will be visual effects. It's a very beautiful piece of work from the people who painted it, <laughs> and the concept as well is beautifully done. What has the Ministry of Magic got against me? We have two scenes in the kitchen. One is a big meeting, um, and then the second scene is a Christmas scene, which is much cosier. And this kitchen was originally designed, but David pushed the length even further to accentuate this difference of Sirius and Harry being apart from the family. God, Toast. Fred, George, Hermione, make sure... But it's impossible to find a table 20 feet long, so we had that made. And the big dressers, one of them is filled with old silverware and pewter in a jumbled mess because the house is supposed to have been looked after by Creature, the house elf, who obviously is not at all able to do this. The two big dresses behind me with the china are one way of giving the feeling of an old ancestral home, otherwise sort of touches of wizardry like cauldrons hanging up from the ceiling. Terry, you all right? The bedroom is at the top of the house, also tall and narrow with mirrored windows. I wanted to accentuate the height by having one of my rare uses of wallpaper and grey and black striped silk curtains. I then found one bed in an auction which had a verticality about it. We designed it to have a higher head and lower foot and to make a second one. 
It's, it's very gloomy and very, very strange. <laughs> Not the room you'd like to spend the night in. The interior of 12 Grimoire Place I enjoyed particularly. I know that Stephanie McMillan, the set decorator, did too. I suppose of all the sets on the film, these three sets, the kitchen, the bedroom, and the hall and stairs have been one of my sort of highlights of the film. It's just got the most amazing atmosphere and it's brilliant, it's so cool. I'd love to live there if we could take like the skulls out of it. Good morning, children. Dolores Umbridge is a new character in this uh, film. She's sent to teach there, but of course will not allow them to have their wands. She just wants them to be little children who don't do anything. There'll be no need to talk. I need to think it's more like it. We decided, since she doesn't teach them anything at all, that we wouldn't have any decoration in her classroom. So it was just the desks, the blackboard, and her desk. And then you go up the stairs and you go into her room, which is completely as we've never seen it before. Dolores Umbridge's world of pink. The walls are tinted pink, heavy pink velvet drapes, a painted pink Aubusson style carpet, and David was very encouraging about the way we wanted to go. It's a great contrast to everything that we had previously established. We do have colour in, in the magical world, but it tends to be colours emotionally associated with the mystical, the magical. So it's brilliant that Joe Rowling's choice for her is this strident sort of pastel pink. <laughs> There was much discussion about the precise shade of pink and much testing of how it would photograph. We just took it, I hope, to a theatrical extreme. The furniture, if anything, rather than belie her character, sort of gives you a hint of what lies beneath in, in that it's this curvy kind of French style furniture. We decided that we hadn't had French furniture before and since it was spiky, it would suit her character. It has this rather aggressive quality underneath all the little lace doilies and placemats and things on top of it. And it's also very obviously fake, very obviously not particularly good repro. There are also things in the cabinets which are like collections of little scissors and uh, hat pins, so again, spiky and aggressive. <laughs> and of course, the cat plates all over the wall. They speak and purr, and they are little spies as well for her. She has lots of collector's plates with pictures of cats on them, the sort of thing you might see in somebody's home. But of course, this being the magical world of Harry Potter, there are moving pictures of cats. And the cats convey part of Umbridge's personality. You know, deep down, you deserve to be punished. We started with a bit of green paint, then we shot film of cats on a separate stage, doing various different things. Let it go, let it go. We had a fantastic session with the second unit filming kittens dressed in cardigans, jackets, hats, in all sorts of situations, which will be played onto the plates. <laughs> So we would receive these big charts showing which cat went exactly where, and they, they all have different personalities and they all do different kinds of things. The cat's performances, which you'd think that wouldn't be an issue, but it was quite a challenge to make sure you'd pick just the right bit of footage of the cat to go into the shot at the right time. It was, as you can imagine, a, a lot of preparation, a lot of discussion, a lot of thought um, in, in that one set. And an awful lot of pink, absolutely. <laughs> Imelda Staunton loved it, felt very much at home there, which was great for us. It's a wonderful world to have inhabited for the time it took us to make this, this film. Lovely. The room of requirement is the room which is actually nothing to start off with until you require something and then it becomes what you require. So, say you really needed the toilet. Charming, Ronald. Joe describes it as having cushions and books, and so we have given it a kind of neutral state, and its neutral empty state when they first find it is that it is mirrored, and that seemed exciting photographically, but also a appropriate in that it kind of reflected you and, and your need back to yourself. But when they need a Death Eater to uh, rehearse with, 
then one appears. Experiment. It is a very, very difficult set to photograph and to light. Stuart's idea was to put the mirrors all, all around the uh, room and, uh, and very quickly we realised you know, that there are no way to avoid reflections. So we had weeks and weeks of meetings about how practical it was to shoot in this environment. So we kind of figured out a way of how we could achieve it. You can angle the mirrors, you can change the angle of the mirror slightly, which helps enormously. And with CG and visual effects, we're able to take out the reflections that we see. We went for this very reflective, unusual, magical design, which just feels quite beautiful. I'm OK. I'm OK. It was just stifling, stifling heat. And it was quite good, though, because we were in there doing all this stuff that was supposed to be really physical, like we've been training and working for hours, which was great, because by the time they cut to us, we were all out of breath and sweating anyway. So it sort of worked, and maybe it was intentional. It just looks like there should be a fight going on in there, some sort of underground fight club in Hogwarts. It's a really, really atmospheric set and the lighting has to be perfect. We invented this underfloor lighting system with Slava Mir, where he could actually light from underneath grills on the floor, and that lighting is not perceptible at all. It was for a time in that it lit, in a rather unfortunate way, the soles of people's shoes. So we covered the soles of their shoes with black velvet. The only annoying thing is the floor is, um, it's like a special material, so um, you keep having to wear these sort of blue shoe covers, and uh, that was a bit of a hassle. Hey, I'm a professional getting his shoes on. Because every time you went in there, if you didn't have the things on your feet, you'd leave foot marks everywhere, and it wouldn't feel magical anymore. It just felt like, a, like you walked all over the floor. Next 338, take one. OK, camera and action. The mirror was very tricky because we had to see the mirror on the wall in the unbroken stage. Then we had to see the mirror break but stay on the wall. Then we had to see the mirror fall off the wall on cue. And then we had to see the wall blow in with all the kids standing in front of it. And rather than use explosives in a situation like that, we use air mortars. Literally blow it out with high pressure compressed air. There's lots of little tricks to that. For instance, instead of using stone or plaster, we use cork because it's light enough not to hurt anybody, but it's heavy enough to fly through the air when you blow it up with, with air or explosive. Um, and it looks real when it breaks, it looks exactly like stone would. The mirror was plexiglass, we had it laser cut to a predetermined brake pattern. We glued onto the back of each broken piece uh, a little peg which plugged into a little hole in the wall. And on cue, we pushed all the little plugs forward. So it pushed all the bits of mirror off the wall, all the mirror falls. It's very fiddly, but it works. Anyone who's seen the film will agree, they look so impressive. And it's a really cool sequence. Three, two, one, back on action! The Ministry of Magic, which Joe created in the fifth book, which is a great new universe. We've never seen it in any of the previous Harry Potter films. There's a sort of 1950s bureaucratic old-fashioned, inefficient vibe to the Ministry of Magic and something that's quite quaint and British and very charming. We thought it would be fun to, in the first instance, to place it beneath the Muggle Ministries. So we went to Whitehall and we went to the Ministry of Defence and in, in that area in there and thought it would be terrific if there was this parallel universe underneath this very familiar one. I've never used a visitor's entrance before. This should be fun. Stuart Craig came up with this notion that it was a series of tunnels, basically, and because um, we both got intrigued by the underground system. We researched early underground stations, um, the Metropolitan Line, the old Piccadilly Line, and there are remnants of those early um, underground uh, systems that, that still survive. So we went and we had a look and discovered that the facades on the street were beautiful classical architecture, but in, rendered in ceramic tile. And then, you know, as, as we went inside, there were remnants also of this Victorian, or turn of the century anyway, 
ceramic tile, but all with this incredible classical decoration. So that was a hell of an idea, and it also had a total kind of logic about it. Ceramic is impervious to the damp and to water and so on, so it is highly dearly suited to the underground. Tunnel shapes are circular tunnel shapes. So, you know, I, I took lots of photographs, reference photographs. So that was Stuart's inspiration for the Ministry of Magic. All these reflective tiles, all these odd little shapes, round circular shapes. And so it's very British. So that's why it kind of chimes, I think. So we literally built this, uh, what well, kind of mini city underground. Sculptors have been sculpting this this gold acanthus leaf and the big statue here over about six months, but 90% uh, of it is a complete phony. I mean, we built a little bit of it physically and then extended it endlessly uh, with uh, computer-generated extensions. This is the original plate with green screens inserted where we're gonna have to then take this and extend it outwards and upwards. You're trying to create something that is actually not there in reality. The whole part of the set is uh, for real, up to about here is real, that's all real, and beyond there is CG. Um, and the other side of the atrium, we've got a whole extension. So our extension spreads up from here. These top two offices are done within the computer. This arch and everything beyond it is done in the computer. You've got the big golden wizard in the distance and the repeating offices all the way back. Um, these offices go all the way up these big columns, and it's basically the classic sort of repeat English office where everybody's just stamping memos and typing on old typewriters and just the business of wizarding going on endlessly. This set is actually, I would say that in the last sort of six years, this is the best set we've had. It's exciting when it works out well, and unfortunately, I think this has. All of Prophecies is our first ever totally computer-generated set. We'd been very dependent previously on very traditional theatrical set-building skills, and so it was quite a departure for us. Department of Mysteries. The whole of Prophecy sequence was probably technically our most complex in the entire film, and it's, it's a bit like walking into a huge graveyard, and it goes on for miles. All you see are these extraordinary, strange prophecies that lie dormant, waiting for someone to come and collect them. And so we created this very atmospheric, strange environment of beautiful glass shelves and beautiful sleeping orbs. And what's fantastic about it is it allows you to get great depth and, and incredible detail. Harry, it's got your name on it. Here we see the first shot where Harry and his uh, companions enter the Hall of Prophecy for the first time. The only thing that's real in this shot, the actual physical real objects that exist in the real world are the, obviously the actors and uh, the doorway that's behind them. Everything else has been created in the computer. This is the original green screen plate. The orange dots you see there, this is for tracking purposes. By tracking the little dots in the picture, we can then work out where in three-dimensional space the physical camera was on the day when they shot the plate. And then this can be translated into the computer software so we can make a virtual model of the camera. And it moves exactly the same way as the real camera did. And then we put that inside our 3D scene and the two things lock together. What you see here is a, an early layout. And what we've done is we've just made simple models of the shelves. So we've got an idea of the architecture of the scene which is a very important thing for, for us to understand how much detail we have to put into it. We call this an animatic or a layout. What you see here is a pretty finished version of the shot. We've added the, uh, the glass shells, we've added the prophecy spheres, the stands, the final version with the primary grade on. You can now see it's all been muted down, all the colours have been balanced, everything's working together. What's been really pleasing is to see the way that all the layers of organic detail, the dust and the dirt and the cobwebs and the very, very subtle lighting design have just brought the whole thing to life and it really feels like a space that you could walk into. Never ever cease to amaze me these sets every year. I'm always amazed by the skill and the, what they can achieve. We have a fantastic team on these Harry Potter films. I mean, the, the painters, the sculptors, the decorators, the prop makers. It impresses me every day, and I kind of live with it, but it is exceptional, truly. Really.